last week, Paul was just introducing himself to the church, and he was talking about um, the hope that they have in the gospel. He was letting them know that it was doing its work even outside of their city, that it was going around the world. Um, we saw some stuff going, uh, some repetition from um, Ephesians, where he was basically telling them that he wants them to um, understand and be filled with the full knowledge and understanding of, of God and who he is, uh, so that they would be able to basically live lives worthy um, for the gospel. Um, and then we talked about uh, how Jesus rescued us from the domain of darkness, and we, we talked a little bit about what the domain of darkness is, um, how it's, it's not always, you know, just the demonic realm, but sometimes it's it looks like someone sitting in church, you know, um, and and that we were transferred into the kingdom of Jesus, and it was only in him that we have redemption and forgiveness of sins, and so we spent some time also talking about how the gospel, we are not the, cent the, the central part of the gospel, it's about Jesus, and it's about the work he did, um, that no matter what we do or how good we look, no matter how many um, times we feed the poor, no matter how much, you know, money we give to people in need or whatever it is, that our righteousness looks like filthy rags compared to what Jesus has accomplished for us. So that's, that's kind of where we left off last week, and then we're starting in verse 15 um, today. Do you want to read 15 through? Sure. 23. <coughs> I'll even back up to verse 13 just so we can there you go. kind of get you know, what you just said there and then into what we're going to talk about. So Colossians 1 verse 13 says he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the, uh, he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him reconcile everything to himself whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become his servant of it. And we're going to stop there. Um, we'll cover the last bit of this. Just stop there at verse 23. Bless you. Verse 15 starts off with saying that he is the image of the invisible God. Um, that one, that one, it's not even a full sentence, really, the way it's written. It, so this, these next couple of verses are kind of like Paul. He's almost, he's almost writing, um, it almost looks like he's writing a poem almost, just kind of, just, or, or maybe a song, I don't know. Oh, man. Um, you know, just kind of talking about who Jesus is. Um, and in, in, in my Bible, it says it, the subject line, which wasn't there in the original, but it says the centrality of Christ. And so now we're kind of, he's really digging down more into talk, kind of teaching the church that it really is about Jesus. It's not about us. Um, but yeah, it says it's the image of the invisible God. So the Jewish people always would have seen God as being the, in, the invisible, right? And, and he was always showing up in different ways, but they never really got to see actual God. Um, and, and that's that's one one reason why creating images um, was detestable is because you can't put God in an image. I mean, he's, he's something that's really undescribable. 
until Jesus comes along. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Um, he is everything that God is in bodily form, in physical form, so that we can see him. Um, John 14, 9 says, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. Right, so if we've seen Jesus, um, now we, we might not be able to see him today necessarily, you know, in the same way that he was 2,000 years ago, but we see how he was in scripture. And, and th- so if we've seen him, we've seen the Father. Um, now, does that mean that God looks like you know, a Middle Eastern 30-year-old man? That's probably not what it's saying, right? It's probably more of a characteristic thing. Um, but, but the grace that we saw, we saw in Jesus, the mercy, the love, the patience, the desire to heal, the desire to bring new, those are all characteristics of God, and Jesus is now showing us what God looks like. Right? Um, I, I've, I've heard it said by, um, I know Todd White's a big proponent of this, so we can listen to him. Um, you know, what, what, and, and other pastors I've heard too, but it's basically this concept of if you've seen Jesus do it, then it's God. But if Jesus doesn't do it, struggle with who God is and what he does and how he runs things and and we have to always remember that Jesus is the image. That's what we should look to. So. Yep. And when when you when we read that passage there that we said looks more like a psalm or a song or a poem, it's kind of split into two parts. The first three verses, which I'll, I'll just read quick, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. So I think these first three verses here of that passage are very descriptive of Jesus in the beginning of time. Um, Like Brad was saying, Jesus to us is a physical visible flesh and blood image of God himself and I even had the same verse that John 14 time um, you know Jesus says when you look at me you're looking at the father so if, you, if we ever wonder what God is really like we just read the gospels and study Jesus and we know what God is like uh, because Jesus is a perfect reflection <clears throat> of God the father and Jesus was created by God in the beginning. Even before creation, Jesus was part of the creation process. Everything that was created was created by and through Jesus. Um, nothing exists in our world that didn't pass through his hands first. Uh, he, he's the glue that holds all of it together. And we, we hear similar language to this in the Gospel of John, verses 1. Uh, first John chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 which says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was with God in the beginning all things were created through him and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created in him was life and that life was the light of men so in short the first three verses of this passage or of this portion of scripture we were reading is Jesus made it all. And then we can move on to verses 18 through 20. Um, he, Paul here, uh, it seems like what he's doing is he really wants the church to see, and us as readers now, to see really the, the large scope of the gospel. Because like last week we were reading, it was very personal. He saved us. He It was, it was a very personal, like, us sitting here chilling with Jesus, he died for you, kind of thing. And then now he just brought this thing cosmic. So he's going from, you know, sitting on Jesus' lap, you know, the little kid sitting on Jesus' lap all the way to, um, it's all about him. Like, we're, doing, we're, we're talking cosmic level. And so, and, and, and I would also, I think it's important just because of different um, strands of belief out there, just to, to point out, when it says that he's the firstborn, Jesus was not born and he was not created of God. He was eternal. He is the Godhead. Um, the second person of the Trinity. He is, he is always was and always will be. What it means by firstborn is that concept of 
he has the rights to everything. Just like it's a positional war, right? Just like the, the firstborn would always receive a special inheritance that the other siblings wouldn't have gotten. Um, so uh, that's important to point out. And then <clears throat> really like just, I, I just love, like Paul just doesn't leave really anything out, right? So he, he's, he's, everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, whether you can see it or whether you can't see it. And then, so he starts talking about rulers and thrones and authorities. So those are angelic types of things, right? We see that several times in scripture. We see that in the Old Testament, the word prince could be used to represent an angel. Um, <clears throat> so he's talking about, you know, Jesus created the angelic and he created things that we can see, right? He created, you know, let's, let's go real big, the earth and all that we can see, you know, giraffes, blue whales, T-Rex, bronchiosaurus, all these huge things, right? Now, now, now let's go even more cosmic, but even but smaller at the same time, and, and let's let's look for some random bacterial molecule that's you know hiding on some planet that we don't even know exists right now. Jesus created that too. Like, he created everything. It was all done by his voice, and then it says that it was created not just through him, but for him. Um, so again, just Paul drilling and drilling and drilling. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. The gospel is not about you. You being saved is not about you. It's all for the glory of Jesus. It's all for his now, um, renown. It's all for his honor. Um, <clears throat> My favorite, one of my favorite concepts, even in the Bible, I don't know, probably just because I like to eat, um, is like, like the one thing that I think of when it says that everything was created not just through Jesus but for Jesus, is like, look at the gifts that we have from God, right? <clears throat> Human beings, we we get to enjoy all kinds of cool things. We get to enjoy sex and music and food. Um, everything was was given to us. But it wasn't meant to stop on itself, right? You listen to that really awesome music and it just hits that perfect chord where voices hit harmony in like that awesome way that gives you chills. It wasn't given to us. Our ears weren't given to us to hear that just so we could say, wow, that's a cool sound. It was given to us so we could say, that's a cool sound. And how much cooler is it that God didn't just create that sound, but he created us with ears to hear that sound and a brain to comprehend that sound and, and have emotions that match with it. Or you grill a delicious steak, or you eat some crabs, or you know what? Pick your favorite food. Cow tongue tacos. The the taste of all those flavors mixing together weren't meant to stop on the steak. It was meant to roll up. Wow, God is awesome that He provided this food for me, and He's even more awesome that He gave me a tongue with taste buds that literally explode when something hits. Like literally, they just explode with flavor. Like it's everything is created and given to us to cause worship. It's all about Jesus. Um, so when Paul says that, I mean, even though he's not being necessarily that specific in these words, that's what he's pointing towards. Um, so I always like that example. That's, that's what I always think of when I hear it's all about Jesus. What's what's I grow? And this isn't my notes. It's just something that you were saying. Like eating a delicious steak, it, it tastes good when it hits our taste buds, but also it's the protein. Mm -hmm. It's like, gives your body what it, it needs to survive. So it's not just satisfying to the tongue to taste it and to experience and to smell it, but it also benefits our body. It mm -hmm. is beneficial. It's not just a, a, a I want to say, I don't, I don't know what I'm uh, it's not just like a uh, passive experience that uh, it's not like drinking a soda that, <laughs> that as I'm sucking down a soda on live stream um, it's not just like drinking a soda that just tastes good on your tongue but is bad for your body <laughs> we have th other things like fruits and, and steak that not only tastes good and smells good but actually is beneficial and healthy for our body yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I would also just say real quick before we move on, you mentioned the holding together, right? So it says that he, it says, and by him all things hold together. Um, 
there, there's a sovereignty about God in that, in that kind of sense that sometimes sometimes that conversation can go south real, real quickly and sometimes it's hard to grasp our heads around it but to, to me as I read that verse it says all things are created through him I mean there are, there are days depending on what the spirit's doing in me where, where I think to myself is it possible that, that the speck of dust floating around my living room is only floating because Jesus is allowing it? it it's held together because he says it can um or, you know, we look at the, you know, I'm not a scientist and I'm not going to get in this conversation right now, but just real quickly, like the fine-tuning concept of the universe. That, that literally if, if um, gravity was tweaked at all, we wouldn't exist. If, if the, the weight difference between, um, you know, the neutron and the proton were even slightly different, we would live in an Earth dominated by helium instead of by hydrogen, and we wouldn't exist. Um, that that there are certain biological things that happen in animals that if they were off by you know, anything at all, an animal wouldn't be able to smell or see its prey the right way. Its brain wouldn't be able to comprehend things the right way. I mean, like, everything is held together by Jesus. If, if Jesus wanted right now to just say, stars drop, and he just wanted the universe to be done, like it's done, um, everything is in the palm of his hand. He is the creator, and he is the king of the creation. And that's just a, that's a crazy concept to hold on to. Sometimes we get stuck at just, you know, singing our worship songs and doing our prayers. And we look at the Bible. We, we, we know, we kind of get the concept like, yeah, God's big and God created things. But then you read a verse like this and it's just like, no, no, it's so much more than that. Like, you know, to just think that the, the that planets right now are floating. We are floating in outer space right now by nothing other than the grace of God. And you can call it gravity, you can call it whatever you want. It's the grace of Jesus Christ that says, Earth, stay there. <laughs> like, you know. Because uh, if it moves, like, I don't even remember what the, the, the distance is. But if we would move, like, further away from the sun, we'd all freeze to death. If we moved even a little bit closer, we'd all burn up. Yeah. So the perfection of what's happening on a daily basis that we don't even realize it's just insane. So verses 18 through 20, I'll read those. Um, so like I said, this I see that this passage is kind of split into two, two parts. So 18 through 20 says, He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by, make, by making peace uh, through his blood shed on the cross. So um, he was the firstborn in life in the beginning, uh, and he was the firstborn in death. So the, the first one to die and resurrect into eternal life. Mm -hmm. He's the cornerstone and the head of the church. Uh, he's our redemption and re reconciliation uh, to connect us, the, the church, back to God, thanks to what he did on the cross. Uh, I, we see similar language from Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, where he says, Therefore, if anyone, was in, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. So Jesus did the work to reconcile us back to God so we wouldn't have to pay the price that he paid. We just get to walk in the benefits of what he did and carry the message of reconciliation with us and share it with the world so in short for this portion jesus paid it all so jesus made it all and jesus paid it all um jesus was where it was there in the beginning he was part of creation making everything peaceful and harmonious 
and Jesus is the one who will finally bring the world back into that same peace and harmony in the end. Um, and Jesus' Jesus' death on the cross was the first step towards getting the world uh, and his people back on track towards the original idea, uh, the, the garden state, uh, so that we could once again walk in perfect harmony with, with God, just like Adam did in the garden. Yeah, he, like... Like what it says that so so and again firstborn we're talking positionally like Jesus wasn't right. born same word used here and and even when it says that he is the the firstborn from the dead so that he might have the first place and everything I think I think it kind of has a two the two kind of a two tiny thing there like so it's still that positional firstborn thing but I think it also could have a connotation of first fruits in a certain way um, but it, like he is the beginning like he's the beginning of the church and then we see the church explode. He's the beginning of life, and then there is more to come. It's like he rose from the dead, and then we see this little ellipsis. It's just like, da da da, like more to come. And, and like he is the beginning of something that's just going to explode for us. Uh, we see that general, you know, that, that resurrection at the end of time. He's only the first. It's only the beginning. Um, and and I just put a note. I put a note down here to just mention that that when it says that he was the firstborn from the dead. Um, I, I just put a, a note there that, you know, we, before the cross even happened, we see Lazarus rise from the dead, and we see, you know, um, the widow's son that was raised, and we see some stuff in the Old Testament, and we see right after he was crucified that the tombs opened. So, so we're not talking about a, uh, a temporal version of life, right? When it says that he is the first who to raise from the dead, we're talking eternal life, the one who first beat eternal death and the first to gain eternal life in a physical body. Because um, Lazarus eventually did die again. Right. Yeah. So I, just, I put that note down there. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned this harmonization thing. So, verse 20, that, that it, was through him, it was through his death and resurrection, it was through that cross that he started reconciling everything to himself. And it, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace. So, so the, the fracture went everywhere, right? And, and, and I think Paul is just saying that from top to bottom, Jesus is reconciling things to him. Um, I think that's the whole concept there. It's just anything you can think of, it was broken, Jesus is, is reconciling it. And I, I wrote down in, in my Bible, it says that, that he is, uh, it says, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood, the, the word there is, he's, it, it's a word for peacemaker, that Jesus is the peacemaker. Um, now, it's not necessarily the word, like the word shalom is not used there, but I think the, the concept of shalom is there um, because he's talking about harmonization. So, he, so through the blood, Jesus is beginning to make peace, um, which is that concept of uh, shalom is that concept of what was going on in the garden where everything was at peace. Everything was one with God. Um, there was no fracture going on. So, so Jesus is doing that. Um, the book I mentioned last week, by Matt Chandler called the explicit gospel. I don't. I'm, this is paraphrase, but he, he basically said that the cross, or he might have even been quoting somebody else. So luckily, this isn't a research paper. Um, basically, the quote was that the cross, in, in, in essence, the cross is the battering ram back into Eden. Um, so it didn't just. It's not just the bridge that gets us to God, the Father, but it's a battering ram that breaks back into Eden because we see that Eden was taken from us. It was guarded by the cherubim, right? So, like, wherever it is, whether it's physical, spiritual, whatever, we can't get to it. Whether it was just, you know, maybe it was just a poetic concept. And, you know, whatever it is, we don't have it. But Jesus, the cross, went back into that and is slowly making us more like him and slowly will be making the world more like it. Um, just a really cool, poetic concept of what the cross is doing. Yeah, verses 21 and 22 kind of get into that. It says, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, it's expressed in your evil actions. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you wholly faultless and blameless before him. So like Brad was just saying, there was a split uh, between us and, and God uh, after the fruit was eaten in the, in the very beginning. Uh, we went from living in God 
uh, living in God's perfection to moving basically into Satan's realm. You know, we were we were separated like the prodigal son was separated from his father. So like, I just picture it in my mind as in the beginning we were like if hands are together, you know, we were just moving along us and God together, inseparable, and then the fruit, you know, Satan came in and and uh, influenced Adam and Eve, and then there was a chasm that split. And, uh, you know, Satan stood in between us and God, and we've just been, God's still been with us, moving along through history, but there's been this chasm between us where we haven't been walking together all of that time. But Jesus came along, and then he died on the cross, and that chasm is slowly starting to come back together. It, we, you know, we haven't gotten there yet. We're not back in Eden yet. But that that gap, is, that chasm, is slowly in, in getting less and less. Mm -hmm. We're starting to move closer and closer to each other as you know we approach the the, the end times, as as we like to call it. You know, um, I, I put a note in my Bible here to like. Sorry if I'm jumping here head, but on verse 22 where it says to present you holy, faultless, and blameless, like I, I put a note there that 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 he's speaking positionally. So like currently in this state, right here, May second, twenty twenty one, Doris Clark, I am not holy, I am not perfect, I am not righteous. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. Like, but positionally. From a spiritual perspective, positionally, Jesus sees me as blameless. Mm -hmm. I'm covered by his blood. He doesn't see me the way that my wife and kids and friends and family see me. I'm positionally blameless, but then, and we're about to go into this here, but practically speaking, there's work to be done as part of that reconciliation. Yeah. yeah our relationship with God is being restored. Uh, and, and he... He can see us now as one of his kids. You know, like I mentioned the prodigal son earlier, we're now being reconciled back home. We're, we're going back home like the prodigal son did. I don't know, I don't know if you have any more before verse 23. But. Well, I mean, I guess kind of like a connection. So like, I did put, um, okay, so once we were alienated and hostile in our minds, express your evil actions. So, important thing here, first of all, mind, that word here, we've talked about this a couple times, it's the center for reasoning, right? So it's like the control center, I guess, so to speak. It was, it was there. The thing that controls us, the thing that helps us reason and understand and all that kind of good stuff, that was hostile against God. We were absolute enemies in our corporate, you know, center of reasoning. Um, and then it says, and it was expressed in our evil actions. Really, really important here to look at what version you're reading and then compare it to the original because ours, the CSB says, hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions. There are some verses out there, I believe the NIV might say it, where based, the, the wording makes it say something like, Oh, you had these evil actions because of because you were hostile in your minds. But what it says there is you were hostile in your minds, and it's because of that hostility you had evil actions. Um, and we often talk about the opposite a lot, where and we're about to get into it. But 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 I love how Paul kind of makes this uh, differentiation or whatever here. Like he's saying, okay, there was one point in time where you were hostile in your minds, and then that made you, that was expressed through evil actions. But now you're blameless and righteous and holy. You are now not hostile to God in that center of reasoning. And then we're going to see in verse 23, he's now going to say, okay, now let your actions show that. So he's totally flipping it on, on, on its head. We were, we were once hostile, and therefore we made evil actions. Now you're not hostile, and this is what you should look like. Yeah, verse 23 kind of gives that big, the big if. Mm -hmm. 
anytime you see if, you kind of have to say, oh boy, here we go. Um, so verse 22 says, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you wholly faultless and blameless before him if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This, Paul, this gospel uh, has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. So there's always the big if that we need to pay attention to. We can be reconciled back to God. We can be found holy and blameless before him. We can live in harmony with God if you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Uh, you've heard us say this a million times, or if you're a fan of Todd White, you've heard him say this a million times. We don't just accept Jesus with our lips and then not surrender our life to him. It's like major. <laughs> we have to get that through our, our heads. We don't just want to give our lip service. He wants our life. Uh, Christi Christianity for a good bit of the world and most of history was something that if you chose to follow, you were choosing to die for it. Um, the, the gift is free to accept, but it would cost you everything to keep. Um, I think we, we have a very watered-down version of Christianity because we've been blessed to live in a place and, and a time in history where we're free to believe whatever we want and no one really cares. Um, so really, we don't care so much in what we believe because no one is challenging us or questioning us or threatening us in our beliefs. So I think we need to remember that this is not just something to take lightly. Uh, you know, this is a lifestyle. We, we should be doing our best to live this out every day, not just on Sunday for an hour. Um, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to screw up sometimes. Uh, sometimes we're going to screw up a lot. Uh, sometimes we won't screw up as much. Uh, but it's okay. It's okay if we screw up. It's part of the process. Um, as long as you're, as you're going at this thing, at, at Christianity, with the men mentality of, I would be willing to die for this if I need to. Now, you know, we don't live in a time and place in history where we really need to worry about having to die for our faith. So maybe we need to change our mentality to, am I willing to live for this? Because that's where we are. We don't have to worry about dying for it, but we can live for it. Um, and I think Jesus was willing to go all in for us. And all he's asking is for us to go all in for him. <clears throat> I would just, and I also want to clarify quickly, like when we say lip service versus like with our lives, we keep like, you cannot, as Paul said, as we will always, always, always say, you cannot earn salvation through your works. That's not what we're saying. It's, it's a concept of, of proving your faith by your works. If you are saved, you will live this way. It's not, it's not a matter of digging down your, you know, digging your heels in and, and trying to be better for God. It's if you are truly saved, if, you, if your faith truly is alive, if you really are blameless and holy positionally, then you will live out this way. And so Paul's saying, you will have this position as long as this is a connection, right? Um, and and just I just want to kind of just shoot. This is just one one concept, one understanding that I was you know as I was studying here that the, when it says if indeed you remain grounded, that, that you know there are some that would say. Um, that, that Paul is kind of has is kind of saying like, if as I assume is happening, or as I as I assume is true, or as I hope is true, you remain grounded and steadfast. So it's not that Paul's calling him out and saying, "Hey, you're not." He's saying, "Okay, if as I assume is happening already, 
you know, you live this way, um, then, then you'll get that, it's that, it's that concept of, um, we see it throughout the New Testament, several Paul's letters to kind of like, you win the race, you, you run the race, you get the prize kind of thing. Um, if we look at 1 Peter real quickly, 1 Peter 1, 5, I, I kind of wrote down that um, he says, I'll start, well, really a little bit before that. Um, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So that's kind of what Paul just said. And then in verse 5, you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So I wrote that down because it kind of sounded when I was reading it that, so Paul's saying, listen, here you are positionally, and you get to keep that as long as you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted. And then Peter is kind of like saying, well, you're kept by that, that faith, meaning like, okay, God, God is still at work in this. It's like God doesn't just say, okay, you have my spirit, see you. Like, you're on your own. God is still at work even in that, that portion of our relationship with him. So here you are positionally, you're blameless, and then God is going, God, God is kind of like behind that faith that you have, and he is kind of, he, not kind of, he is part of that, that, that work that's coming out, right? He is that one that's made, if it's real, if your faith is real, if your position is real, that he is helping you, um, you know, through this so that you can live according to the way that, you know, that, that life that's worthy, as Paul said now in two letters, um, so yeah, that, that's just kind of one one concept out there of, of what Paul's talking about. Um, but you know, so so our action our actions we have to just remember that our actions are are the fruit of what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and I keep wanting to say something. I keep forgetting what I was going to say. I'm sure, it'll come back to me. But um, but yeah, the the that 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 if part is kind of like. You know, the fruit. It's important. We, we often forget that um, we get so tied up in grace, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. And obviously, it's such a huge part. It's the main part of the gospel. We have to be tied up in grace. But sometimes we get to the point where we're so tied up in grace that we forget about the work part, right? James tells us that faith without works is dead. Um, so... In that sense, once we are you know, saved or whatever you want to call it, we, we are part of the process of sanctification. God is the main one behind it, but like, I, I have to wake up and do something with the freedom that God gave me. Like The blood of Christ freed me from slavery of my flesh. The, the blood of Jesus broke the chains. Now what am I going to do with it? Like I now have the spirit living in, in me. I now have the power. Am I going to do something with that, or am I going to ignore the spirit within me and not have the fruit of the works, which will then prove maybe that the spirit is in me, I guess. But. That's all I got right there. Yep. So next week we'll finish out this chapter. Uh, we'll... The, the last couple of verses of this, of this chapter are a little, uh, I thought it was kind of complicated, so we wanted to just spend a little bit of time uh, breaking that down a little bit um, and doing a little bit more digging on it before we just throw out what we think it means. Uh, so we'll, we'll um, cover that next week, and then we'll jump into Colossians chapter 2. We will uh, move on to communion now. You all at home are welcome to join us in communion if you'd like. You can use whatever you have around the house, bread and whatever. And as always, we, we do believe that you should, not as, we don't believe that you have to, Come hang out with us or watch our videos every week, but we do believe you should be a follower of Jesus um, during communion. So if you're not sure or you're not, then we ask that you would refrain from that.
Um, but if you are doing it for your first time and uh, you know receiving Christ for the first time, if God spoke to you today, then this would be quite a fantastic way to celebrate that. from Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 14. It says, When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I fervently desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and eat the bread. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Go ahead and drink. All righty, well, thanks for joining us today. Um, for those of us that are here in person or uh, on Facebook or whether you're joining on YouTube later, thanks for just being a part um, of our time together and our celebration. We pray that uh, what happened today, what was talked about today, would be fruitful in your lives. And um, as always, we invite conversation. I know it's sometimes a little difficult virtually, but please comment or ask questions on any of our social media, and we'd be happy to you know, join in that conversation, answer questions, have conversations with you. Have a good day. Enjoy the beautiful weather. Yep. Uh, keep Also keep an eye on our social media so you know where we'll be next week. I believe we're going to probably be in Littlestown at the Littlestown Community Park uh, as long as the weather cooperates. So uh, just keep still keep an eye on social media just in case anything changes. But uh, if you can join us next week, that's probably where we'll be.